conceptual Hello everybody, this is Dr. Rick dropping in on you. Hope everybody is having an exceptional day to this point. Uh, this is going to be the beginning of a series of examinations of excerpts from my book, Born in Captivity. Uh, people often ask, you know, where my perspective and where my perspective and and my positions that I stand on come from, and it's from thousands upon thousands of hours of scientific research in historical research and social uh, examination of our people from uh, as far back as 400 years up until today. So to examine behaviors, examine environments, examine uh, sciences behind behavior to understand how those who oppose us think how they act and behave in their attempts to manage who we are and what we are and how we move and how we respond to that all of that is in volume after volume of what i've written what i've studied what i've spoken and lectured on for years uh, and so I'm going to take you in, into Born in Captivity, a, a, a snippet at a time, and we're going to sort of break some things down to give some understanding to why we do what we do, where we're at, what we need to do, what needs to change, and so much more. Uh, Born in Captivity is my 19th uh, book. Um, uh, the subtopic of Born in Captivity is Psychopathology as a Legacy of Slavery. And we're going to examine that. We're going to examine how our behavior is still connected to an experience we supposedly uh, were emancipated from uh, 150 plus years ago. So I'm going to read just an excerpt of chapter seven. Facts mean absolutely nothing to the conditioned mind is the uh, title of the chapter. Uh, there's a quote by Carol Mosley Braun. Uh, that says, defining myself as opposed to being defined by others is one of the most difficult challenges I face. And it's because our, our self-image is structured and sculpted and developed based on the reflected appraisals of other people predominantly. And ultimately, it becomes a, 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 a manifestation and an expression of how we see ourselves in the world. Uh, so it's very important to understand this when we are dealing with our uh, youth, especially the young youth under the age of five, because they're still impressionable, they're still learning, and we're still setting the standard of what they will expect for themselves in this world. Okay, so I'm going to read just an excerpt from this chapter. It says, I am often asked why blacks, with so much factual information at their disposal, fail to seize it and effectively appropriate it. My response? Facts mean absolutely nothing to the conditioned mind. As a race, blacks underestimate the power of mental conditioning. I would even argue that the ones who argue the loudest against it are the most conditioned. Mental conditioning is more than the result of suggestive thought influences. It is the complete constructive dynamic that serves to develop and sustain the paradigms that determine the lens through which a certain group of people see life. The conditioned mindset that so heavily influences the black collective is one of the most complex, co complex constructs developed, implemented, and sustained through history. It dictates how we see ourselves, how we see others, how we treat ourselves, what we expect from ourselves, and more. This conditioned mindset is so strong that it serves as the most prevalent form of slavery. There's an old saying that says you have not created a slave until you can, with certainty and comfort, remove the chains and maintain control. The only true slavery is mental slavery. Physical slavery is a manifested symptom of psychological slavery. If a captive desires freedom and despises his captor, he is a prisoner, not a slave. But when the captive adopts the thinking submitted to him by his captor, 
when he accepts the captor's idea of God and their assessment of inferiority, he will naturally submit without the chains and boundaries. He will find a certain level of comfort in his current position and situation. It becomes his new identity. This level of conditioning was so successful during slavery that when a slave still desired freedom and would run at the first opportunity, they were diagnosed with a mental disorder called drapedomania. Mental conditioning begins with the creation of an identity crisis in which culture, faith, and family are disrupted for the purpose of separating people from their history and heritage. When a person loses sight of who they are, it becomes much easier for someone else to provide them with an identity that makes it easier to manipulate and control them. This is what we're dealing with. And one of the things that I talk a lot about in my lectures uh, is an identity crisis. And when I use the term identity crisis, I mean it as just that. There is a loss of the sense of identity at a level that has created a crisis that has spanned over decades. And there's no end in sight. Uh, when you don't know who you are, when you have a false impression or understanding of who you are, your behavior is reflected in that false understanding. There has been a great effort put forth over time to ensure that we are uh, to ensure that we are compliant, that we never really truly discover who we are. You have to understand that uh, in the onset of slavery, one of the things that was uh, immensely important in the subjugation of the slave population was the removal of the values, interests, and principles by which the slaves inherently and historically operated. So we're talking about historical family values, historical uh, perceptions of divinity and, and God and spirituality, uh, names, Everything that presented a specific idea of who you are and where you come from. See, names are a part of heritage. Names are a part of inheritance. Names have a soul sense of identity. Um, I'll give you a prime example. And no one ever really thinks about it except someone who studies linguistics and studies behavior and understands the connectivity. When you call someone and you're introducing yourself for the first time, do you say my name is or do you say this is? My name says it's just an attachment. That's what it is. It's my name. But when you say this is, it identifies you. It's a part of your identity. I am identified with that name at a level that it's me. It's me. It's the same thing as saying it's me, but you're saying it to a person who doesn't know it. So you say, this is Rick. So when I, when I'm speaking to somebody, I know say, Hey, it's me. And, and they say, hey, but, but, but that's the power of identity. But when you take a person's name and you give them a name, then they have to seek the understanding of the name. So how it applies to them, they seek it from the one who gave it to them. That's why in many African cultures, the father was the one who named the child. Why? The father was the primary source of identity. It was through his lineage that the name of the family and the family values moved on. These things were taken away. They were done purposely. And so what you have to understand is there's this thing that I developed a theory called collective bias uh, syndrome. Uh, collective bias syndrome is collective cognitive excuse me collective cognitive bias syndrome is a intellectual awareness that has a bias that is lended towards past experiences and it is generationally accumulated and multiplied and so we talk about generational well i mean generational trauma 
Generational trauma is transmitted in a multiplicity of ways. It's through social learning theory. There are just certain behaviors we pick up from our parents simply, simply by observing them and following through. A lot of the behaviors, a lot of a lot of the way of thinking, a lot of the way of approaching things has simply come from watching and observing and passing it down. And after a while, you don't even know why you're doing it anymore. You just do it because that's what you grew up watching. Uh, a more emphatic and impressive way that so uh, that generational trauma is passed down is epigenetically and that is literally the the genetic imprints or tags on top of the genetic expression uh which is your dna every time you experience something traumatic it imprints your cells record it it's literally held as a record in every cell in your body as your reproductive system continues to move which includes cellular reproduction that tag is passed on to the next generation of cells. Your body is constantly regenerating new cells. And this tag is so powerful, this impressive tag, it's literally passed on to the next generation of cells. And even though, uh, even, and even in the, this, this, the generation of, the regeneration of cells is called mitosis. Uh, and that's where one cell uh, recreates two cells that are absolutely identical to it. And then it dissipates and dies off and the body regenerates over and over again. So the skin you have on your body, the outer layer of the skin you have on your body now will not be there three months from now. It will have completely reproduced itself. OK. And in the cell, in the reproductive system where we actually use the organs um, and cells to reproduce ourselves via sex, the reproductive process is a little different. It's called meiosis. Meiosis. Uh, allows for the breaking down of cells and the splitting of uh, chromosomes. Every person has 46 chromosomes, but what happens is you get 23 chromosomes from your mother, 23 chromosomes from your father. So the reproductive system breaks down 46, makes it 23, and the 23 merge to create 46. Uh, but it also cleanses. This is why a woman has a cycle. So if her egg isn't fertilized at a certain point, that egg passes, and another one is done. It's, a, it's a, actually... A nature's way of cleansing out a lot of the things that you don't want to pass on. And so unless it's immensely emphatic, a lot of tags are washed away. So a lot of bad experiences aren't passed on. But we know from studies conducted on survivors of the Holocaust that grandchildren who were not even uh, alive or even thought of during the Holocaust were having dreams about experiences that their grandparents had that were very vivid, very accurate, that had never been expressed. They were so terrible they didn't want to talk about them, but the children were having dreams. They couldn't explain it, so they started to do research on it. They were literally genetically passing the memory down. We know this happens. Uh, the backside of the epigenetic uh, spectrum is that your genes are literally logging your environment, environmental experiences on a daily basis. So the, the higher the level of stress, the higher the level of antagonism, the higher the level of anxiety in your environment, the more disease genes are upregulated or turned on, and the more the, the, the genes that are designed to keep you healthy are downregulated and turned off. Uh, this is actually the predominant cause of most cancers, lupus, a bunch of other uh, autoimmune diseases, uh, and so many other things. This is why children who have what we call childhood adverse experiences uh, in, in, in their childhood end up with long-term health implications because you're, there's this thing called psychosomatics. It's a part of the epigenetic process. And so what happens is you have all of these things going on simultaneously and you literally can worry yourself to death stress yourself to death stress yourself into illness but the 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 reverse of that is when you find peace when you find calm when you're able to develop confidence when you're able to extract yourself from an environment of high stress in a consistent way you also create a level of peace and you upregulate the health genes, the genes that are designed to protect you from autoimmune uh, illnesses, from uh, cancer, from uh, pneumonia, from all these other things. The more you stress, the more prone you are to get sick. Now, imagine, imagine having a progressive generational issue with trauma. It's been passed down. 
traumatized people traumatize people traumatized people behave in a way that their their progeny will tend to pick up their behaviors uh, there's also the epigenetic uh, transmission of trauma and then there is what we call traumatic re-injury traumatic re-injury is this point in which you're because uh, what happens is people uh, who make the slavery was 150 years ago argument uh, make it as if in 1865 when slaves were free we walked off the plantation we were given our 40 acres in a mule we were given free run we weren't antagonized in any way we were given an equal share of opportunity and everything was good and copacetic no one is considering that the first 12 years of our emancipation was considered the years of reconstruction where the South literally bombed Union installations and shot up Union installations to the point that the North withdrew their military presence and the South began to reconstruct its antebellum roots in everything except for the use of the name slavery. We got the black codes. We got convict leasing. Uh, we got so many other things that continued the terror of being black. It actually was more dangerous being free blacks than it was being slaves. As slaves, we had a level of value and worth to our slave owners. And so uh, it wasn't good business to kill a slave. After we became free, lynching became common. And so we act like that didn't happen. We act like we didn't experience red redlining. We act like we didn't experience urban renewal, benign, uh, urban renewal, benign uh, neglect, that we didn't experience um, uh, 70 years of Jim Crow segregation and so much more. And we continue on with serial force displacement, mass incarceration, gentrification, and uh, miseducation, and so much more. These things are still taking place right now. All you have to do is have an ability to break it down and look at it and watch how we're moving. You have to be able to reasonably explain how we're 150, what, this is 2057 years removed from slavery and we haven't really progressed in any measurable category we're still in last place in every socioeconomic category and the wealth gap is widening it's not narrowing it's widening you have to be able to explain how that's happening and it's a combination of the mechanisms and machinations of a society that wants to keep us oppressed because they benefit from our oppression and our participation in those acts by not understanding how things work and by not taking the necessary action to change things. I believe I did a very good job in breaking out the basis of this dilemma in Born in Captivity. Uh, I would really suggest if you haven't read it, a lot of things are going to become a lot clearer. Uh, if you haven't read it, Born in Captivity, Psychopathology as a Legacy of Slavery. Uh, book number 19, um, one of my best works. Uh, I think the, my latest, The War on Black Wealth, Breaking the Code of Generational Wealth, I think that might be my best work. Um, I just revised it. it. The revised edition is coming out this week. Uh, but Born in Captivity, you really need to check that out. Um, and I'm going to keep going. We're going to keep talking about uh, the different elements and components of this whole thing. We're going to talk about a lot more about uh, collective cognitive bias uh, syndrome and how we tend to collectively move in directions that are diametrically opposed to the desires we say we want and not conducive to our empowerment and why we do it. And so we're going to look and look into all of that. And so, again, this is me challenging you to stand up, make your presence felt, be involved. Also, with organizations like myself uh, and other people I partner with, like Endow and Hearts and others that actually have boots on the ground. And we're right now in the midst of meetings all this week on the things that we're going to do in 2023 to up our uh, intensity in serving the community. And we're doing this without having had any help, uh, to be totally honest. 
uh, but we continue to do it. Uh, we continue to find a way. We continue to make it work. My challenge is that you get involved. So there are going to be several links. There are going to be a link in in the, in this in, in, in the description box of this video. There's going to be a link to Born in Captivity. There's going to be a link to the war on uh, wealth, black wealth. And there's going to be a link to give and donate. Uh, you find where you fit in. If you want to do all, uh, you're more than appreciated. If you only want to do whatever one that uh, you feel, do what it is you feel. But we've got to make some moves. On that note, look, I'm going to get off here because there's so much more I still have to do. Thank you guys for stopping in. I actually did it. This might be the first time.